so today is Carl Sagan Day, and actually, um, a lot of us do remember that it is Carl Sagan Day. Uh, that's what today's program is celebrating. And we have a special speaker for that, and I'll read his bio and intro. You can read it here on your white sheet as well if you like. I didn't do anything. Um, was that me? All right. The search for life in the universe is one of the grand quests of current science, and there are multiple approaches that are likely to yield results within the next few decades. Depending on the nature of these discoveries, there may be a variety of impacts on society. Morrison was one of Carl Sagan's first graduate students, and he will also share some thoughts about Carl and his influence on science and science literacy. We can speculate on how Carl would respond were he alive today, when there are so many who are not simply un uninformed, who, I'm sorry, who are simply uninformed, but who are actively anti-science. Dr. David Morrison is the director of the Carl Sagan Center for the Study of Life in the Universe at the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. He was also the founding director of the NASA Lunar Science Institute and a senior scientist in astrobiology at NASA Ames Research Center. He received his PhD in astronomy from Harvard University in 1969 and has published more than 170 technical papers and a dozen books. Morrison is a passionate advocate for science education and he has written extensively about the struggle against pseudoscience, such as the denial of evolution and global warming. He is a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry and a member of the Advisory Council of the National Center for Science Education. Please help me welcome Dr. David Morrison. Who's here behind you? Hey. Thank you. Is the mic okay? Can you all hear? Good. Uh, if you can't hear, put up your hand. Uh, yes. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. This isn't just Carl Sagan Day. It's his 80th birthday, if I've done the, uh, the arithmetic right. And, uh, you know, he could well have lived to be 80 and look like some of you in the audience. <laughs> um, but I will also admit that I didn't realize it was Carl Sagan Day until I got the invitation. We all know about Darwin Day, that gets a lot of publicity, but uh, Sagan Day is a, an interesting concept and I hope it catches on. I'm going to talk about two different things, as you heard. I'm going to talk about Carl and, uh, and a bunch of stories about him, which I think you'll enjoy. But then I also want to talk specifically on a topic that was very near and dear to his heart, and that is the search for life in the universe. Let me start briefly with Carl. Uh, I was his first graduate student to start with him. I confess I was not the first to finish. I was uh, passed by by a couple of others. Uh, but it was a real privilege, as you can imagine. Uh, I went to Harvard University Graduate School, assuming, as almost all astronomers did then, that I would study stars or galaxies. I mean, planets just weren't within the sight of anyone. Um, Carl arrived, and a number of us graduate students uh, took his first planets course in our first year. And three of us immediately said, this is great, and uh, went to Carl for seminars and just figured that we were going to shift into planetary studies. Uh, the majority of the graduate students turned up their nose and said, who wants to study planets? We want to study galaxies. Yeah. And so they went that way. Um, Carl was an excellent thesis advisor in that he was truly inspirational. Uh, going, hearing you know, from the beginning, the talks he gave to the public at Harvard. Uh, it was before he was on TV, although uh, not too long after he, he started appearing on the Johnny Carson show, it was a real privilege. And it was wonderful to get his inspirational interest, not just in the science, but in the public and in education. And what he later defined as uh, his baloney kit, the baloney defense kit, so that people could somehow learn to appreciate the beauty and the reality of science and not be taken in by the false gods of pseudoscience. Um, 
I, worked, I saw him at scientific meetings after I got my degree. I should say, I should temper my praise for him as a thesis advisor by saying he was not a hands-on thesis advisor. He didn't actually help me much with my research. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, he provided the inspiration, he provided some of the ideas, and this is the way he worked much of his life. Um, he certainly did science, but he was not, he didn't program computers or do kind of calculations. He wasn't an astronomer who went and observed at telescopes. Um, his basic thrust was ideas and what we call back of the envelope calculations. He could instantly, it seemed like, scope out a problem and understand the directions you would go to solve it. He was wonderful to have attending scientific meetings because after many papers he would stand up for a question and you knew it would be a cogent, pointed question. Uh, he was wonderful to have in, in uh, NASA committees, especially those that were planning spacecraft because again he had this, this breadth of vision and the insight and the articulate words to convey it to others. In terms of his actual science publications, the majority of them are collaborations because he worked with others who, you know, in a sense did the hard work, uh, but not really. You have to have both. You have to have both inspiration and ideas and then the tools uh, to carry them through. Now, I saw Carl at many scientific meetings and worked with him on spacecraft, in particular on the teams of the, the Voyager spacecraft, which went to all the outer planets uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, but there was an inflection point in his career. And I, saw, I was there to see it. He was working on Cosmos, the Cosmos television series, at the same time as the Voyager encounters with Jupiter and Saturn. He actually moved out to, uh, to Pasadena, where the studios were, and lived there for a couple of years. He also met Andrewian, his love of his life and his partner, and endured a very messy divorce with his then wife, uh, Linda. But during the, uh, the encounters of the Voyager spacecraft, the first cosmos came out. And some of you are actually old enough, you may remember seeing Cosmos when it first appeared. And uh, I had the privilege of going out to dinner with Carl, just the two of us, in a small, a dark little Thai restaurant in La Cañada near JPL. And we were having a good time talking. A person from another table came over and said, you're Carl Sagan, aren't you? wanted to shake his hands and say how much he loved Cosmos. And Carl turned to me and he said, this is suddenly starting to happen. I'm no longer anonymous. People will come up and talk to me and he, their, the feeling seems to be that if you have been in the television in their living room, you are their friend. You have been to their living room. <laughs> and of course, as his, his fame increased, this, this multiplied. But the next time I saw him, he was traveling with a handler. He was uh, taking limousines to and from the airport. He had a nanny to go with the, along with his wife and kids. And he would clearly move to a different plane. He still participated in science, but he was a public figure. He was probably the most famous scientist in the world. And he took advantage of the forum this gave him, the bully pulpit, to get into many political issues. Um, he also truly had to change his lifestyle because I don't know if it seems surprising to you, it does to me, but he suddenly got many death threats based on the Cosmos series. And at Cornell University, for a couple of years, they had to assign full-time, 24-7, uh, policemen to sit outside his home uh, to protect him against the tax. In the, where his office was, his name was removed from all of the directories, was removed from the door. You could only get into the, his office by going through the, the next office where his secretary was. Uh, and he really was forced into a completely different and less open way. When he came to scientific meetings, he was still himself. But the rest of the time, he was a public figure. 
And of course, as you know, he got involved in many political issues, particularly the struggle against the Star Wars uh, ill thought out missile defense system of the Reagan administration. Um, he also became a world celebrity. I remember in the late 80s being at a scientific meeting in the USSR and sitting in the conference room of the director of the Space Research Institute in Moscow. And suddenly looked, we looked up and here came Carl Sagan and Robert Redford walking through. Say hello to everybody and went on to what they were doing. They weren't there for our meeting, uh, but I'm sure they were doing something important. Um, so I will come back and, and talk more about Carl later, but I want you to understand that he, he was an inspiration not just to me and to many of his students, but of course to millions of people. Uh, how many of you watched the most recent Cosmos? I think Neil deGrasse Tyson is absolutely fantastic. He's a fantastic speaker. He is the nearest thing we have to a replacement for Carl. And I think his treatment of Cosmos showed that. But he's not Carl Sagan. He's not as famous. He's not somebody that everybody knows. Uh, even though he's been in your living room, I'm not sure if you saw him, you would go up and introduce yourself and say hello. Uh, but times have changed. Remember, Carl did his thing before the internet existed. When Cosmos appeared, there were only four or five television networks that were able. Cable had hardly begun. There was ABC, CBC, uh, the public channel, and uh, I guess CNN had started then. So it was much easier for him to become the singular spokesperson for science because people read the same magazines, read the same newspapers, watched the same television channels, quite unlike today. Well, let me go on and, uh, and talk about life in the universe. I'm sure you all know that this was one of Carl's single greatest passions. And he was unique in that he decided to learn both biology and astronomy. He did his PhD in astronomy at the University of Chicago. He then came out to Berkeley and spent two years as a postdoc in biology. And some of his, uh, his most enthusiastic collaborators were biologists, including several Nobel laureates. Uh, some of the astronomers looked down on him from the beginning because, you know, planets were not real astronomy. That was stars and galaxies. And life, that was not astronomy at all. And I'm sure this same thinking uh, was important when he was denied his membership in the National Academy of Sciences much later. But he believed that the search for life in the universe was the most interesting challenge for astronomy and indeed for the public and everyone, something that I presume we would all agree with. So I'm going to take you through a discussion briefly of the search for life in the universe and how it's coming. Let me first of all state, I hate to have to, but it's true, we have absolutely no evidence for any life beyond Earth. Not only have we not found life, we don't even have evidence for it. We have evidence for what we call habitability, that is the existence of environments that could support life. But we've never found any indication, either extant or fossil, of any life other than Earth life, or of any planet that's a living planet other than our own. So how do we go about the search for life? Until now, most of the techniques have involved looking for habitability looking for environments, particularly in our solar system, especially on Mars, that either could support life now or might have been more clement in the past. The other side of that coin is we have to understand life on Earth, the only kind of life we can study, and try to understand its adaptability, the range of environments in which it can live so that we can mesh our understanding of the capability of life with the environments that might support it. I'm sure most of you realize that in spite of the appearance in here, 
We are living on a microbial planet. Microbial life dominates. Some of you may not realize that there are almost, there are between five and ten times more bacterial cells parasitically living in and on your body than the cells of your own body. Um, when you eat, you're not just feeding yourself, you're feeding a biome of thousands and thousands of species of microbes. When we talk about the release of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, that's the chemistry of microbes. They were here first, they've been here for four billion years, they still dominate the chemistry of the atmosphere, for instance. Um, and it's a good thing. When we first were talking about sending astronauts uh, to other places, I, I was one of those who kept saying, You'll, you can't send an astronaut alone. The astronaut will take these 10,000 species of microbes with them. And we better worry about their health as well as the health of the, of the astronaut because you have a synergy here that's necessary as far as we know for life. So there's nothing, we, we look primarily for microbes and that really makes sense because microbes came first. I hate it when people refer to them as primitive life or as primitive life forms. We have microbes that have existed and evolved for more than three billion years. They have a lot more history than animals or plants or certainly than we do. They are extraordinarily well adapted. They are extraordinarily capable. They are extraordinarily sophisticated in their way. There are microbes that can switch their chemistry. They can, if they can go, they can go from an acid to an alkaline uh, environment, for instance, or from photosynthesis to deriving their energy from chemical means. Same microbes can, in some cases, make this shift. Uh, they're not primitive at all. And they are the first and perhaps the last thing that we would look for when we look for life elsewhere. There are three ways that we're currently developing a serious search for life. I remind you, if you remember way back then in 1976, NASA sent the Viking spacecraft to Mars with the avowed goal of searching for life. That was a very daring thing to do because we really didn't know very much about Mars. We'd never landed there before and in some ways we didn't know a great deal about life either. But a system was designed with four very clever experiments, chemical experiments to analyze the soil and, the, and try to see if we could find evidence of metabolism. Now, inevitably, we were looking for evidence of life like ours. Chemically, that's really all you can do. Uh, and that is a general problem. We only know about Earth life, and so we're really inevitably searching for something analogous to Earth life. It's unfortunately a little bit like the story about dropping your keys and looking for the keys under the street light. Uh, you'd be a fool if you didn't start looking under the street light. And that's the stage we're at. Uh, Viking did not succeed in finding evidence of life on Mars. It helped us learn about the environment and all the subsequent missions. And there are about seven or eight spacecraft now in orbit around Mars or on the surface. They're studying the planet. There are spacecraft from the U.S., from, from Europe, from the European Space Agency, now from India, which has its first Mars mission. Uh, it's a great focus of interest, but we're not doing the Viking experiment again. We haven't figured out what I guess a tricorder is supposed to do, something you can point and look and it will find evidence of life. So we look for evidence of things that are similar to Earth-type life. The solar system is the first place to look. That is the first technique that I think most of us think of. Can we find indications of life on another world? And there are four places that are potentially of great interest. The first is Mars. Mars is always at the top of your list uh, because it is the planet most like Earth. Venus, 
might once have been like the earth, but it has experienced a runaway greenhouse effect. It has a massive carbon dioxide atmosphere, 100 times more dense than ours, a surface temperature hot enough to melt lead. It's one of the worst places you might want to go. Whether it might have been a clement environment three or four billion years ago, we have no idea. But Mars was. We can see on the surface of Mars evidence of its conditions over a wide span of time. And we know even though it has very little water now, it did have liquid water on the surface. Perhaps the most important discoveries of the surface spacecraft, the rovers, has been clear evidence that Mars was once wet. It may or may not have had deep oceans, but it did have water, probably rather saline water, maybe even too much uh, of the, the salts to be supporting life. I mean, there again, we don't know, and we're beginning to get in this question of whether we can judge the habitability of another world by our own the ability of Earth life to survive there. The water is, very little water is on the surface now. Um, it's cold, it's dry, the, the, the pressure of the atmosphere is less than 1% that of the Earth. Uh, it's not a pleasant place. I should comment when I mention about searching for life on Mars on Viking, there were these four chemical experiments. There was another one. There was a, it was the first time we landed cameras on the surface. And Carl Sagan, you can imagine, he said, we ought to look and see if something walks past. And he did. He and his students went through every single photograph to see if there was evidence of something walking past or crawling past or wiggling past or flying past or whatever. Uh, of course, there wasn't. But it was the kind of thinking that Carl brought that was a little bit out of the box, but certainly made sense to do. Um, so the other three places in the solar system where we would be interested in looking for life is Jupiter's moon Europa, one of the four original Galilean moons of Jupiter, which was discovered uh, to be completely surfaced with ice, frozen water, in the Voyager days, and then subsequently the Galileo spacecraft demonstrated that that water ice was only of order of 10 kilometers thick, and underneath was a huge ocean of liquid water. There's more liquid water on Europa than all the oceans of the Earth but it's under this thick ice cap. So in some, if, if water is your criterion, uh, then Europa is the best place in the solar system to look. And obviously that water wouldn't be liquid if there weren't a heat source underneath too. So you have the right condition that way, but it's pitch black. It's isolated from, from sunlight. There is no atmosphere above. And we really don't know. We think if you got life started there, it might survive, but would you start it? And here we have the virtue of one of the coolest experiments I think has been done in astrobiology uh, in the last decade, and that is the discovery of subsur subsurface life in the aquifers of hot water three miles down below South Africa in the, uh, the, the gold mines that they have there. And there are microbes there that, as far as we know, have no chemical interaction with the surface whatever. How do they get their energy? They get it from the chemical byproducts of nuclear radiation. The uranium in the, in the ground produces some chem chemicals that they can absorb and extract energy from. And as far as we know, they're living a completely, they're a different world. They're living an isolated life down there. We don't know much about them, but we could certainly imagine that below the surface of Mars there were also aquifers of liquid water, and maybe something could be living there, especially if it once had good conditions on the surface and got life going, and then you know, as the surface conditions deteriorated, life migrated inward. Uh, we don't know about Europa. We don't know. We think it probably always had an environment more or less like it does now, a deep liquid ocean with a thick ice on the top. And it's damnably difficult to imagine how we would get down into that ocean to find out what's there. 
Enceladus is a very small moon of Saturn. No place you would think of looking at all. But the Cassini spacecraft has found plumes of material coming out of the South Polar area. You can see these things spraying upwards. And they're liquid water. Now, we don't know anything about what's going on inside Enceladus, but at least here's accessibility. We could make a spacecraft that would fly through those plumes and collect the water and, and examine it. Uh, we aren't now. It's a long way away out at Saturn. But it's, it's interesting because of the relative accessibility provided by these plumes of water. The fourth place in our solar system is Saturn's very large moon, Titan which is truly another world. It's extremely cold out there. It doesn't have liquid water. The surface much of it is solid water. But it has an atmosphere and it has something like our water cycle, only it involves methane and ethane. It has lakes on the surface. It rains. It just doesn't rain water. Now, methane, ethane, and their, their uh, chemical similarities are, of course, organic compounds. Could you build life on that without using water as the solvent? We don't have it on Earth, Earth. But if you took, if there were life on Titan and you brought it to Earth, of course it would immediately die because it would be too hot. Uh, so it's very long shot to even get out to Titan. But think about the implications of finding life on any of these worlds. If we found life on Mars, for instance, by drilling down a few meters into the aquifer and extracting it, living organisms, we could, of course, analyze them. We could do a complete genetic map of them. And if they were genetically similar, not identical, but similar to ours, if they had DNA and RNA or something like it, we would probably conclude a common origin of Mars life and Earth life. That is that they formed either it started on Mars and pieces of Mars were transferred to Earth with life or the other way around. And so what we would be detecting would be our distant cousins. And of course that would be fascinating. Here's, here's life that has evolved independently for three or four billion years. And it would be extraordinarily interesting to see what that life was like. But it wouldn't necessarily tell us that the Mars life formed independently of Earth. We may have had a common origin. If we get out to Europa, uh-uh. There's no communication of rocks back and forth between Europa and Earth. That would be the evidence of a second genesis, of an independent origin of life on Europa. If we uh, went to Titan, not even sure how we would recognize life, but that would be fundamentally chemically different. It would be based on entirely different carbon compounds and low temperature. And, you know, that, that would be extraordinary. If we found life with independent origin elsewhere in our solar system, that would greatly encourage us to think life could form most anywhere. The conditions were right. If we found weird life, truly different life on Titan, then that would expand our, our uh, hopes and understanding tremendously about life on other worlds. Well, let's, I think, by the way, that it's quite reasonable within the next 25 years that we might succeed in finding at least fossil life and maybe extant life on another place in the solar system. What's the second technique? Well, going much further away, which means we're never going to be able to send spacecraft there. It has to be remote sensing. But we always assumed that planets were the most likely place for life to form and flourish. Again, we're biased a little bit by our own understanding, but you know, we don't know any better. And in the last three years, we have found more than 4,000 exoplanets. It has been the biggest revolution in astronomy. Well, the, one of the two big ones, the other was the dark matter and accelerating universe that you have in cosmology. But here, for the first time, we consider other planetary systems. We didn't know they even existed, let alone able to understand them. We have systems with as many as five planets around the same star. We have verified 
about 2,000 of these planets by independent means. We have shown that there are more small planets than large ones, which no one had any way of, of uh, anticipating. That is, there are more Earth-like planets than Jupiter-like planets. That was not the first impression. The first impression when people began to detect evidence of, of other worlds was that there were a whole lot of Jupiters out there. But this was simply observational bias. You found the big planets more easily than the small ones. And now we know that there are Jupiters, there are some, but there are only a few percent of the total. And the majority of planets are of Earth size or smaller. There's also a whole bunch of them that are intermediate between Earth and Jovian planets. We have nothing like that. We call them super Earths because we don't know what else to call them. We don't know if they're liquid or solid. We don't know what they are, but they're common. So if life could exist on a planet with 10 times the mass of the Earth, that would greatly widen the opportunities. Um, we have several means of detecting and studying exoplanets. The first one that would come to your mind is take a picture. However, these planets are around distant stars, and the planet tends to be only about one millionth the brightness of the star it's circling. That is an extremely difficult task. It's like somebody said it's like detecting a moth, moth in front of a big searchlight. Uh, we're beginning to develop that capability. It's amazing what astronomers are doing. And they're going to be building bigger and bigger telescopes that we can take pictures. But you can well imagine, again, we're going to start by taking pictures of the big ones and discovering big ones. It's not, it's hard to imagine within the next few years that it's going to get us down to the level of Earth's. The second way of finding them is to look at the reflex motion of the star as the planet goes around it. Because after all, they're, they're linked by gravity. And so as a planet goes around, the star goes back and forth too. The heavier the planet, the more the star moves. And Jeff Marcy and his colleagues at Berkeley in particular have been tremendously successful in using extremely high precision Doppler spectroscopy to measure the very slight motion of the star. They don't see the planet. They see the star. But the motion of the star tells them about the presence of planets. And that's where the original discoveries of lots of Jupiters came from, because they're big and they're easier to do that way. The third way is very much like the spectroscopic, only now you image the field. And as the planet, invisible planet goes around, the star moves. And you measure its motion against the background. Again, requires extreme precision. Uh, it's never worked. It could, but it doesn't work with ground-based telescopes. They don't have the precision, and we've never built a space-based telescope. This is what's called the astrometric means, by measuring positions of the star. The fourth thing, well, you can't see the planet. But you can tell when the planet passes in front of the star because the star gets dimmer. It's called transit photometry. You have extremely precise measurements of the brightness of a star. And if a planet goes in front, the brightness dips and then comes back. And this is the basis for NASA's Kepler mission, which is the source of almost all our discoveries of extra planets. We don't see the planets. In effect, we're seeing the shadow of them. We're seeing the effect of them when they pass in front of the star. And that's where our, it's now more than 4,000 planets have been found, including those down to Earth size. That, that's an amazing revolution. Question is, what could we search for on these distant planets that would be indicative of life? Well, transit photometry doesn't help. Astrometry doesn't help. You almost have to image them and then do spectroscopy or some other technique. And what you would be looking for is a so-called biomarker or biosignature in the atmosphere, a change in atmospheric composition that suggested it was produced by microbes. Well, we can't do it yet. We're building a big new telescope in space, the Webb telescope. Uh, there are two 
consortia of astronomers that are building 30 meter telescopes as opposed to the 10 meter size we have now. Absolutely extraordinary instruments. And the hope is that they will be able to look at the planets at least around the nearest stars. Starting with Alpha Centauri, the closest star to us has a planetary system. And look for chemical evidence, things in the atmosphere that would suggest life such as the oxygen in our own atmosphere which comes from life. Um, I think there's a very good chance within 25 years that we will succeed in identifying a biomarker. Now I'm sure that there will be many scientific debates about the reality of that. Does that particular gas truly require the presence of life? And so it won't just be that suddenly one day you'll open the newspaper and it will say life discovered on planet around Alpha Centauri or something. But, but that's the direction we're going and I think within a 25 years we have a good chance of succeeding. The third method completely different. We look for a civilization that's sending a radio signal to us. SETI, a search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Now we're not looking for life. We're looking for intelligent life. We're not looking just for intelligent life. We're looking for technological life that knows how to build radios. And we're assuming for whatever reason that they might be beaming radio signals out into space. We do, of course, uh, mostly accidentally, but uh, we've been sending out uh, radio programs and, and powerful radar signals and so forth for almost a century. Uh, so one searches for indications of extraterrestrial, intelligent, technological civilizations. Your presumption is probably that those are not going to be common compared to, to worlds that just have microbial life. You don't know. But they could be detectable at much greater distances. If you imagine a planet out there that's intentionally broadcasting its presence to the universe, it could be you know, a million times stronger than a background. It could provide a humongous signal. We haven't found it yet. I cannot predict when that will succeed. It's just we simply have no idea how frequently planets will produce intelligence, whether intelligence will lead to technology, whether they will broadcast signals. Certainly there are very intelligent creatures on our planets like the cetaceans who show no evidence of building radios. And uh, so, you know, there's no, no, no compelling reason to think that intelligence would go in that direction. But it has the possibility of succeeding and that one could happen tonight. Or excuse me, in the daytime because it's radio and you observe in the radio as well at night. That could happen right now or next week or next year or next century or never. So I can't say that'll happen in the next 25 years like I do the others. But here are three completely different ways of searching for life. And any of them could succeed. Now, one interesting story about Carl Sagan in these searches is he had the idea that instead of looking for individual nearby stars with our radio telescopes to see if they were sending a signal, let's look at the Andromeda galaxy, the whole galaxy at once. You fit the whole thing within your radio beam. Of course, it's a million times further away. But he said, look, we don't know a priori whether there's going to be anything there or not. And we're looking at 100 billion stars at the same time when we look at the Andromeda. Only has to be one of them transmitting. So he and, and Frank Drake uh, and a couple of other people got observing time on the big Arecibo radio telescope to do just that. As far as I know, it's the only time Carl ever actually went to an observatory uh, to, to make observations. And so they sit in the control room and they turn the telescope toward uh, the galaxy and start integrating to see what they can find. And he's, I'm told this, I wasn't there, sitting there, you know, interesting, watching the, the oscilloscope and so forth for an hour or two. And then he picked up a book and started reading. And the next day, 
he didn't come back to the observing. Not that he didn't think it was a good idea, but he just didn't have the patience. He thought, if it was going to work, it might work right off. You might get the signal the first night. And of course, they didn't. But it was a good idea. So let me conclude by going back to Carl. Um, he would undoubtedly I shouldn't say undoubtedly. I think Carl would be disappointed and shocked by the state of science, education, and public acceptance. When he was the world's most famous scientist, certainly people hated him. I mean, he had death threats. But in general, you know, science was assumed to, to be telling the truth. And when people criticized the Star Wars defense system as being impractical, and Carl was one of them, eventually they won. Uh, there was still the creationists who wouldn't accept evolution. There was nothing like the climate deniers now who refused to accept climate science. And I have the feeling that the internet and cable and all of this has given many, many more platforms for the non-scientists and the anti-scientists to poison the waters with these absurd claims, whether it's the face on Mars or uh, the, that homeopathic medicines work or that GM foods are bad for you or any of the many things you can think of with Climate and evolution denial, certainly the two most potent and dangerous things right now. I wonder what Carl would do. I wonder if he could get a platform by which he could, in effect, address the whole country and do something about this or not. You can compare it with Neil Tyson, who has many of the same communications uh, talents that Carl did, and he uses them or Bill Nye, the science guy, who does. But none of them is a national or international figure in the same way that Sagan was. We need him, but I don't know, I don't know how effective he would be. There are a couple of other anecdotes that will interest you. Uh, I invited and chaired a talk he gave here in Palo Alto about 20 years ago. I don't know if any of you were in the audience. Just one of his public lectures. It was beautifully done. And there was a clever guy in the audience in the question period that asked him a question for which the obvious answer was billions and billions, a phrase Carl claimed he had never used. And so Carl gave an answer, and he, you know, it became a dialogue, two or three way dialogue with the guy reformatting the question in a way that, that really invited the answer of billions and billions. And Carl finally looked at him, some of you were there, may have remembered, he said, I know what you want me to say, and I'm not going to say it. <laughs> uh, but I guess even he accepted that because. Uh, one of his final books is now entitled Billions and Billions that was published posthumously uh, by his wife. He ventured into fiction by writing the novel Contact, which I think is a wonderful novel. I mean, it's really a cool, understandable scenario of what the discovery of a SETI signal might mean. And of course, he also had a uh, woman scientist as his heroine, and that was very much one of his interests. When Carl, Carl had three wives, and his first wife was Lynn Margulis, a famous scientist in her own right, a brilliant woman. She entered the University of Chicago at age 16. She eventually became a member of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, was an evolutionary biologist. They had two kids. And Carl let her do the housework and cook and take care of the kids. It just is shocking by our current understanding of the role of the genders, but that was what it was like back in 1960. Uh, as he grew older, he became more and more interested in gender issues. And of course, marrying Annie Drillian who is a very strong-willed, brilliant woman in her own right, I'm sure helped him. Um, 
We all know that Carl was a great speaker and a great writer. But he lived in the era before word processors. He never learned to type. I didn't either. I remember when I was in high school, the typing class was just for the girls that want to be secretaries. So how did he write all this? He did it all dictating it with a dictaphone. Uh, his first major book, The Cosmic uh, Connection, he dictated while dry in six days while driving from California to the East Coast alone with just his dictaphone for a companion. I mean, he knew this stuff. It just poured out of him. But uh, he did that all his life. And it was a technique that no one does today that really is kind of interesting. Because since he was speaking this, it turns out that his writings sound sort of conversational. On the other hand, his spoken things are very well organized into sentences and paragraphs and easy to follow. So he got double duty. The fact that he did this by dictating improved both his writing and his speaking ability. Nobody today does that. We all sit there in our word processors. And, and I think dictating was extremely successful for him and of course allowed him a higher productivity too because he used the same material in talks, in publications, it, into things like articles in Parade Magazine, which is widely circulated, and uh, then collected into books. He was very productive. And let me conclude by saying, while he was inspired and he was brilliant, he also worked very, very hard. He had almost no outside interests. He wasn't a sports fan. He didn't sing in a choir. He didn't do other things for fun that people do, except smoke pot. He got into that, and that, that worked fine for him. But uh, he really, somehow, recognizing his talents, he decided to make the most of them. And nothing deflected him from the simple hard work. And he had his priorities set from the when Johnny Carson would call, his, his uh, organizers would call once or twice a year for Carl to come be on the Johnny Carson show. In those days, that meant flying to New York for that 10 minutes or 15 minutes. He always did it. He dropped whatever else he was doing to go do that. Uh, he was a very serious person. And I really wonder what would have happened if he had lived, what he could do for our problems today if his final book, Excluding Posthumous, was The Demon Haunted World, which I recommend to you. I wish it were over here on your table. I think it's the best thing he ever wrote about the problems of understanding science and the implications for policy. And that was, in the end, what he was even more interested in than exploring space and finding life. He wanted a literate, scientific community and a nation and a world that understood science and used that in decision making, something we all still need today. So I will stop there and thank you and have a few minutes for questions. Okay, so we'll move into the Q&A and I will bring the mic around if you raise your hand if you have a question. And I, it just catch my eye as you, Already, okay, I have some already lined up, so I'll come to you. Go ahead and just raise your hand and I'll come to you. Yeah, uh, Jerry Grass. Um, I saw the movie Contact. I didn't read the book, but I love the movie. I'm curious how many people here have either read the book or seen the movie. Not bad. How many of you read The Demon Haunted World? Good. I've read part of it. I, I have a copy at home. I got to get around to the rest of it. The other thing is, I was born in 47, and Sputnik went up, I think, around 57 or so. And my recollection is the country got rather serious about science at this at that point. I think that may have been one of the best times in the United States for science. And uh, maybe it'd be nice to have something like that again. And so that may have created a context that was receptive to Carl, but there was a long gap in time between 57 and 
67, 68, 60, well, 69 when he first went on the Johnny Carson show. My question is about SETI. Um, based on the amplitude of our signals that we send out, um, how far away could another Earth civilization be if we were pointing the whole array at it to uh, detect just normal everyday signals? Our most sensitive radio telescopes would be just barely able to detect Earth-like signals coming from the distance of the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. So we talk about listening for leakage radiation, which is what the Earth does. You know, we aren't broadcasting to space intentionally, but we would be detectable. Uh, and that's marginal with our current receivers. On the other hand, if they were broadcasting intentionally, we should see them. And in fact, if you go to the extreme and take our radio, Arecibo radio telescope and imagine a twin somewhere else and the two actually pointed at each other, we could detect a civilization across most of the galaxy. So it all depends on what you think is out there. Are they, is it leakage radiation? Are they beaming something? Are they beaming something toward us? That would make all the difference. Over here. <laughs> In the late 1970s, uh, I went to uh, a meeting uh, in which uh, it was, uh, uh, there was a puzzle that uh, perchlorates had been found on the surface of Mars by, I think it was Viking 2, uh, and, and, and we were charged with explaining that, uh, which I couldn't, uh, and I never heard the resolution of that. Uh, you, they were looking for for oxygen as evidence of life, and perchlorates, ordinarily, as a chemist, you would think would be extremely oxidized. So it would be evidence of oxygen and therefore of life. What was the resolution of that? How did perchlorates, they were, were they real there, and, uh, and how were they generated? Well, I can probably answer that in general, but not specifically. Mars, because it has a thin atmosphere, is bombarded by solar ultraviolet light, which is sterilizing. There's a lot of photochemistry on the surface, from UV hitting the surface and interacting with surface chemistry. You would not want to, to be there. Uh, it would be chemistry that would generally destroy any microbe that landed, even if it could survive the other things like the cold and the low atmosphere. So we think about the subsurface of Mars today, or ancient Mars, when it had a thicker atmosphere and water. Today, it really wouldn't be much fun to be sitting on Mars. It was not uh, widely discussed at the time, but in the 1970s, Carl Sagan used to visit Palo Alto frequently. Uh, that was because in conjunction with Viking, there were a lot of satellite photos taken of the surface, um, and they wanted to find things that changed <clears throat> over time. Um, and he, as you noted, he was not into computers, but uh, we had a research lab in the foothills above Stanford, part of Stanford, uh, called the Stanford artificial intelligence lab and we worked out a coalition uh, in which we processed the imagery and uh, were able to overlay photos of the same area taken at different times so he used to come out about once a month to, to cool. visit and I observed that uh, consistent with your remarks he never touched a keyboard. <laughs> he always got somebody else to do that. But uh, it was uh, an interesting time. And uh, um, well, that's just an observation. I have a question. Um, it, I uh, observed that the Earth ran into another planet about four and a half billion years ago. And, and threw off a blob called the moon. Uh, that pla other planet was apparently about the size of Mars. It could have come from our own solar system, 
or it could have come from somewhere else. There are a lot of planets wandering through the universe that are not orbiting uh, stars. Um, a very short time after that, water, liquid water appeared on the Earth, and a very short time after that, life appeared. Uh, I wonder <coughs> if it's, it seems likely that that life was imported, perhaps on a wandering planet or a meteor or something like that, rather than being uh, spontaneously formed here. Uh, and what's your assessment? Well, that's an interesting speculation that I don't think we can answer. The fact is that at the time the Earth collided with this Mars science object, we have evident think we, we understand that there were a lot of these protoplanets floating around the not floating, shooting around the intersolar system. So it certainly seems likely, and most people just assume that it was a part of our solar system. The distances between solar systems are such that we have never yet detected a comet, for instance, coming in that came from outside our solar system. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much communication back and forth. And in the case of life, uh, it's very hard to imagine a condition under which life could survive an interplanetary uh, or interstellar trip. So biologists are trying to understand how life formed here and whether the same thing that happened here could have happened other places. But I can't prove that hypothesis wrong. Hi, uh, excellent talk. Um, I'm just a little curious, it, when we first start broadcasting, there's a lot of leakage, but if you look at how technology is evolving, that's a kind of a waste of energy and so we tend now to sort of send signals directly to a satellite and so on, so there's going to be less leakage. And it seems to me that if most advanced civilizations are working that way, then there would have to be intent on the part of the extraterrestrial civilization to try to contact us. And that's going to depend on them knowing that we exist, which depends on how long we've done this leakage. And I'm just curious if you have some ruminations about those sort of things. Well, I mean, you, you've stated it. That, that's a very interesting line of argument. If you think that they are truly beaming at Earth, then they presumably have some reason to think that we're listening. Uh, if you think that they're just sending out a general beacon in all directions, very high power. Uh, I think that's probably what we're thinking of finding because you're absolutely right about leakage radiation. It's wasted radiation. Uh, it's not very much in terms of energy. But all of those, uh, those broadcast uh, TV sitcoms and all of the radar signals uh, are lost. And of course, the, the way to explain the Fermi paradox, for instance, which is why we haven't found any of these, is that they all went to cable. And with cable, you don't broadcast. Uh, there's one uh, beam that we may not uh, think about is the fourth beam. And I've talked to uh, Seth Shostak from I SETI. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a quantum physics phenomenon known as entanglement. And if we are looking for somebody out there that is experimenting with ent entanglement, that means they're intelligent. And uh, he said, good idea, but tell me how to do it. So I'm still thinking, have you any idea how to detect somebody that is working with entanglement? I don't even know what entanglement is. But that sounds like something that Seth would be interested in. Uh, Seth is not only a brilliant speaker, but somebody who really does think outside the box. And uh, if you ever get a chance to have him talk to you, do. Yes, uh, you've said a number of times that there's uh, no evidence of life from um, outside our planet. Um, and you just mentioned that uh, you don't see how life could survive an interstellar uh, travel. But so am I, do I misunderstand that uh, I've been, from what I've read, uh, there have been discoveries of meteors in Antarctica and perhaps other places that have at least shown um, 
carbon chains and microbial tracts, or possible microbial tracts, and that this might, I know it's controversial, but that this might uh, in fact be uh, proof that life um, has rained down on Earth and can survive interstellar travel. Yeah, uh, that's a multifaceted thing. Let me say, first of all, that the, the people who have done careful analysis of meteorites have found no evidence that they contain or ever did contain anything alive. They do contain chemical building blocks of life, and those can survive because they're much shorter uh, carbon chains than the sort of thing you would have in life. Um, but there are a few people who do claim that they're finding evidence of, uh, of life in meteorites, and I think they're wrong. Uh, Norton Bell, I have a, a comment of more general interest. Um, first, I want to thank you for an excellent review, complete, thorough, and I also want to thank you for your work for the National Center of Science Education and uh, improving uh, science education in this country, which lags behind the rest of the world. Uh, on a more general thing, um, humanists have always felt that one of the major uh, goals is to improve the human condition. I know that's not in the Humanist Manifesto, but most of us think it probably should be. And second, uh, we're all aware of the fact that millions of uh, children live in poverty and go hungry every night. Now my question, how can you justify the expenditure of large amounts of funds to satisfy the curiosity of people and reduce the funds that would be available to reduce human suffering when this research could be postponed with no change in the results or even reduced? Well, I don't think it can be postponed because I think that the curiosity and scientific curiosity is an inherent aspect of being human and that we have to work on that. You can ask an individual case, but you know, in most cases, the dollars spent on anything like space research or astronomy are absolutely negligible in face of the uh, challenges you would have in dealing with ignorance and poverty and, and health and so forth. Uh, so I don't think it's a correct thing to compare one against the other. Uh, sure, you could give up exploration and science, I don't think as humans we would, and I don't think we would be doing any service to the next generation if we, uh, if we stopped. Because there's a lot of inspiration here. When NASA, 20 years ago, this was, but still true, was asked the question, how do you justify the expenditures for NASA to a single mother in Chicago with a high school education? The answer was, we provide inspiration that may help her child grow into a scientist and be financially successful and make something of themselves. Yeah, John Carpenter. Uh, the, yeah, it could happen that life forms could themselves have uh, trans, radio, trans, radio frequency transmitters and receivers and then the life forms themselves could sometimes collectively transmit a message which would uh, increase the power of the transmission and, and uh, therefore would not uh, involve technology at all. In other words, they have built in to their life forms the technology that we have to develop to do the same thing. Yeah, I, I don't pretend to understand how the aliens would think. But again, the, one of the reasons that we, the SETI searches the radio spectrum is that it is so cheap to send radio photons. The actual number of ergs of energy, even with a big transmitter like, uh, like Arecibo, or with something 10 or 100 times that size, is just a negligible fraction of the total energy budget that we have to deal with. So, uh, and not that it's easy to get the funds even for that small amount, but in terms of energy, transmitting by radio waves is extremely efficient. I read something about the possibility of detecting 
uh, photosynthesis or chlorophyll from other planets. Uh, and and the, que the question is, on Earth, are these things uh, necessarily life? Or detect like b bacterial life or whatever. So maybe there's a way of detecting bacterial life, you know, if it's not intelligent. Is that a possibility? What do you think? You can certainly detect uh, chlorophyll spectroscopically on Earth, but I think if you imagine looking at a distant world, that the signal is much stronger from changes in atmospheric chemistry, like the introduction of oxygen, we would be much more sensitive to that than being able to detect chlorophyll or any other of these long-chain organic molecules. So we have time for probably two more questions. I see two questions. Okay. Hi. The uh, sky is pretty big, and uh, so is the frequency spectrum. Uh, how much of each have we looked at so far when it comes to looking for radio waves or other waves from other civilizations? Well, people like Seth Shostak and Jill Tarter have these visualizations in which you have uh, the frequency and the intensity, and we look at the amount of that volume of space that we have observed, and it is minuscule. Uh, but it is enough that we're getting to the point where we could detect uh, signals from planets anywhere in our galaxy if they were sending them. So, you know, half empty, half full. If you just look at the whole range of possibilities, we just did a little tiny thing in the corner. But uh, it might be enough since you don't know how prevalent civilizations are or what, what, what energy they'd be transmitting. We just don't know. We don't know how to compare what we have searched with the total search space that we might need to get an answer. Hi, I just wanted to thank you very much for coming today. Your lecture was beautiful. Could you tell us a little more about the African aquifers? About the Martian aquifer? Africa. African aquifers. African aquifers. No, I can't. No expert in Africa. Hey, let me conclude with a thought that you may want to take away because of this organization. There's been a lot of speculation as to what the effect would be of finding life elsewhere, especially intelligent life. What would its impact be on religion, on philosophy, on thinking? Two interesting comments to make. One, of course, is that uh, in many areas of religion, they welcome, I mean, they, they're given no trouble. You go to the, the Jesuits, like my friend uh, Guy Consolmagno, and he's a very great proponent of SETI and not worried at all from the point of view of the Catholic Church. The Dalai Lama has said from the Buddhist perspective, no problem, we want to do it. So it would not necessarily be a problem for people. Would they notice? Well, there I have another perspective. If you go back to 1900, after the canals on Mars, so-called, were found up through the 1920s, it was common knowledge among educated people on Earth that there was intelligent life on Mars. It was generally believed. Did it affect us? Did it stop World War I or World War II or do anything like that? No. So. Uh, it's interesting to speculate whether that would be more than just a big news story for a week or whether it would have a real effect on our thinking to know we are not alone. So lunch isn't quite ready. We have time for, I'm going to play it by ear, one question at a time. All right, so we do have one more. If you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. I don't have so much a question as an answer. Good. You know, and again, I, I apologize for trumping you on Carl Sagan Day. But what would Carl do? I learned from Carl that it wasn't for an asteroid, we wouldn't be here. Not so much from Carl, but from science. You know, they just give them some credit too. Um, I learned from a book by a guy named Gibbons, Alone in the, Alone in the World. He made a very good case about all the things that had to happen to make this planet possible, whether it's hit 
you know, we got the one moon, which is really helpful. Three moons, not so much. Um, he knows what Gaia knows, that we evolve on this planet. We are a creature of this earth. We don't have any superpower natural over our head. They're ourselves. That's who we are. I don't know, as a species, who we are yet. I know that living around here is a good place to live for me. You know, I'm a, a philosopher and I'm, I'm in bed with science. So now we're here. We're brand new. We're only 200,000 years old and we didn't know shit until about 400 years ago. Now science is going so fast that the rest of our humanity has not been able to keep up. And we better start thinking about keeping up because it's science that's got us here. And the only way we can get out is through science. And so we need to cut our population. We need to quit raising so much food for feed our animals and, you know, and eat food that's actually good for us. And that's just a start. I'm saying as humanists, we should be involved in humanity's futures. Because I think what we think as humanists is a way to think. And it's best for all individuals. I mean, the, the point is, and I'll make, I'll make it one thing, our point as a humanist is that we equal human value equally. So that everybody born has the same value. We know in reality that is bullshit. But it's certainly a good goal to look at and, and to point your arrows out to achieve. So I'm just thinking that, please guys, start getting involved in politics. Uh, I think the Green Party can help us. And uh, we'll go from there. Bravo. Okay. <laughs> One last question, if it's quick. Is it quick? quick. <laughs> the lunch is just about ready. This may be a crazy question, but I know on Earth we have lots of forms of life. The ones that are down deep in the ocean that we discovered recently that have no eyes at all. And when I went to Yellowstone, they pointed out one of these little boiling uh, uh, places, you know, uh, from, from volcanic. There are, there's life in there that lives in acid. Now, is that still carbon-based and you would still, okay. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how broad the, uh, the range of environments are in which we have life. One that interests me is called radiodurans, and it's microbes that live in the cooling water of nuclear reactors and in uh, various uh, uh, chemical dumps that are considered uh, sites where no human would ever want to go. How come? Where did it come from? Uh, there are, they can tolerate wide, some microbes can tolerate wide ranges of, of uh, pH or of salinity. They're from temperatures as high as 120 Celsius, that is 20 degrees above boiling, to minus 20 Celsius, 20 below. There's life in all those places. So, so we mustn't be too parochial when we look for, uh, when we define habitability on other worlds. All right, I lied. We are going to just slip in one last question here because it's coming from our youngest attendee. I loved your speech, and I also want to ask a question. It is, what would, you, what would you do if you actually found life out in space? Some of us would celebrate. It's more likely to happen in your lifetime than mine. So you may have to answer that. But I think it would, I cannot see any downside. Finding other life would be an affirmation of the importance of life, not just on Earth, but in the universe. And I think that'd be cool. And what a note to end up on. So let's everybody join in. Thank you, Dr. David Morrison. <laughs>